is Staff Sergeant Mo. We are live with the Washington AP3 <laughs> with Jeanette Finnicum here. We're going to do some awards for the Washington AP3 members. They're going to honor some of their members right now. They've just honored one. Her name is Nicole. A lot of work she does. So I'll be quiet now and let me know if you can hear everything okay. There's also a gentleman who has traveled about and he acquires some help in the I didn't say the word. Yeah. So he's he's got some help with other forms of transportation development. But Lyle Puckett has developed our transportation department. And fought hard to get the zones to do likewise. So Lyle. Good, good, okay. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> A lot of words on that piece of paper. Okay, so much for that. <laughs> so much for that. But anyway, uh, it was one night me and my uh, son-in-law were sitting down enjoying a meal at a restaurant, and uh, we were talking about AP3 and stuff like that. That's before I knew about you guys. And Jeff was eavesdropping and listening to everything that I was saying. And he came over and introduced himself. And here I am. Uh, a couple months later, Nathan asked me if I wanted to head up the transportation department. And I uh, told him, yeah. You know, it's going to be tough because I'm always gone. Those of you that know me, I'm only home like two, two days a month, three days a month. But in the process, uh, I got to know a real good family. All of you all are my family. And uh, I've been working really hard to try to get the transportation department going. And come to find out, I was the only one in the nation in transportation. So I was a test. And in the process over the months, well since last year, we've got a, uh, we started a uh, uh, emergency response uh, like uh, uh, command center. We were going to do it on a 53 foot dry van trailer that I donated. And then uh, we went from that I acquired a motorhome, 29 foot motorhome, and we decided to turn that into the command center. So now we're working on that. And we also have a uh, uh, extraction vehicle for a service vehicle that we're working on. And my vision for this organization nationally is to have every state set up, every state able you know, in case of a natural disaster or, or shit hits the fan, we're going to be ready in every state in this country. That's what my vision is. And and if I can make that work, then this is going to be great. 
You know, anything happens in this country, we'll be ready for it. You know, natural or governmental, we'll be ready. But anyway, that's my vision. That's what I'm working on. Uh, I did finally get some help at Justin standing back there at the back door. We uh, got him back, and uh, I'm going to turn him into a fine man and show him how to work on vehicles and keep them up while I'm gone. And uh, we're going to get this thing rolling. We're going to have a good transportation department. We got the equestrian, equestrian Jeff. Equestrian. <laughs> so words you can't say. But we got the equestrian division started up over on the east side. And uh, Rick has that over there. He loves his horses. And those of you that's going to be at the FTX this August, you're going to get to see his horses. And he'll love to show you how to ride. So, okay, there's my 57 pages. <laughs> Seven pages. For his undying love for what we're doing, we'd like to present this next award to Scott Sparks. Up next is Scott Sparks. Walking up, it. her name is Nicole. And for his dedication, Rob, this is for the I'll Washington AP3% members. Like the They're awarding them, and also the last speakers <laughs> and throughout the district community to include the next benefit. Thank you, you all. Uh, uh, appreciate it, much appreciated. Uh, nothing could happen without all of you, so. Really American uh, Patriot. I was just kind of the glue to put y'all together. So, Three uh, percent. Just honored to be here with all of you. So thank you. WA is for Washington State. And with That's my said, home state. So, and Jeanette Pinnicum is here today. Tonight. They are hosting their award ceremony so with speakers to include Jeanette Pinnicum here in the state of Washington. Into what it has become today. Steve Cooper. Next up is Steve Cooper. Trying to get a the Zone 2 North area. Oh, there's a child the behind me that burped. Uh, we got Mike, Rudolph, 
It's an award ceremony and speeches to include Jeanette Finnegan, who will be speaking. And I didn't, I didn't want to start live videoing just for the speakers. I thought the awards, these, these men and women in my state are fantastic members. They work hard and they train hard. They're very professional. peaceful assembly tonight. <clears throat> I'm going to jail. Just kidding. Thank you. Oh. Not doing it again. We all, we all know being prior to the military. Um, I'm also prior law enforcement, so uh, we all know what a brotherhood is. It truly is. So thank you all, and thank you all my brothers and sisters in AP3. Amen. I want you guys to just take notice how many former military and former law enforcement are part of our Patriot groups. Just take notice. Our next award goes to someone who has created his own little niche. He also helped out another state as well and participates in many of their events. And this man is Gabe Heckler. Yeah. Yeah. Next up is James Heckler. Hi, Elena. Hi. I got your text messages, <laughs> Elena. Pretty shocking. Uh, I couldn't have put it with my eyes on. Just me and my own best friend. I see you keep on good work in every zone. She saw your message. I'm sorry for the shaky camera, but I brought the message over to Jeanette for her to see, and that was her message back to you. And thank you for your work. Four. Mm -hmm. The next man on our list has actually just stepped into his position, oh. which has helped our state get a little tighter. And this man is Gene Criswell. Gene Criswell. Oh, James, I'll let her know. I don't want to keep going back to her table interrupting her. She's right next to me, but I'll show her again later. You're so sweet, guys. She knows. Trying to help him out. I really don't want to do it. Thanks for everybody showing up out here. Keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. Patriot groups, this is how you treat your members for their due diligence and volunteerism and hard work and training. All right, so we also have a new, another new zone leader, apparently new. He's stepped up, showed up. Thank you, James. Come out to many events. Mommy. Even though he lives up by Canada. <laughs> Our zone one CO, Antonio. I'm gonna make sure she sees the message of Antonio. You know, this is beyond humbling, you know. I can't, I would never phantom being in front of this. I believe in this print the first time I heard Scott Seaton speak on a podcast. 
I told my wife. Keep the comments coming because the Washington AP3 will see this later. Sergeant Major of our 
uh, entire organization, Jeff um. Rouse, who has been a huge among us The other community award that we had is our uh, uh, friends from the uh, LMC uh, who decided to come out and help us uh, support us here. So, uh, Alan Cost, can you come up here for me? Yeah! <laughs> we appreciate everything you do in the community. Bill.
I didn't sign up for that. Mm-mm. I sure didn't. Amen. Now, that is why I joined the movement, quite, the 3% movement, quite a That's while ago. Right. To try to establish a foothold here in the United States for we, the people, to coalesce and be under one united umbrella. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it come together. First of all, one of the things that us in LMC, the 3%, is earned. And once you earn it, you keep on earning. The patch that they wear, they keep earning it every day. Just because you're a patch member of our group, you can't get comfortable. You earn it, and you continue to earn it. Those are the expectations that I have with my brothers and sisters, from the LNC, That's from right, East Anna. to West, and from the Lady Liberties that support us. Those are my expectations. Those are our expectations of one another. And let me tell you, we're coming together, and we're building bridges, and we're getting stronger. And that's where I see AP3 to continue. You have supported us in the past, and that's why we're here today to continue to support AP3. <clears throat> now there is a mutual respect, mm -hmm. bridges, mm -hmm. and now we're force multipliers from one another. Mm. My gosh, look at this room. A big diversity of America. Amen. That is what I immigrated to. We are That's what I wanted. Growing. But slowly as I, you know, half my career spent over here, I came back. And I didn't see that anymore. But we're going to get back. And I believe in all of you. I believe in all of you. We're going to get it back. Again. Thank Woo! Woo! Thank you. Words are so powerful and motivating. This is why I do what I do. To see men and women like you do and say this. They're so powerful and so yeah, motivating yeah. and so inspiring. Um, I was dead on. Dead on. And we are going to get back. And uh, every day, you know, we get stronger and stronger. And our communities see that, and they see the, the work that we're I'm doing. Still here, it's not Can it's because we me? love each other, it's because we love our fellow men here in the United States, and women, and that we that, that we're okay. going to fight for them. Okay. We're not going to let them be trampled. And uh, we know what's happening, that the injustices that we're seeing, the uh, the enemy is on them at all points, and uh, they're devastating. They, they've got more money than we do, they've got more power than they, we do, and they change the rules when they want to change the rules. Um, but we're waking up to that, and more and more people are seeing that, and they're waking up too, and it's only a matter of time. So keep up. Keep That's up. right. That's Do right. Amazing job. The tide is turning. People are offering me drinks. I think they're trying to make my public image look so, uh, good. Just uh, kidding. Steve, <laughs> the, uh, got another speaker for you. Uh, the special guest speaker, Mrs. Jeanette Bacon, has come up here for us. And, uh, I'll move closer for you all. A little something. Um, you know, we all know the story. We all know what happened. We all watched it happen. Um, the uh, the darkness was was thick that day, and uh, when I was in, uh, on base the other day, I was watching the AP3. Saw this coin, and you know us military guys, we love getting our coins from some. So um, I saw this one. And I said, "Well, this is perfect for her," and it is a military coin, and it says, "I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me." And on the back. It is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And I want to give you that military point for you. So uh, we're going to get her set up here. Um, hopefully we kind of, it, it'll just take a few minutes. And, and, we'll do uh, a quick pan around the room. Court.
Well, well first off, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here. Um, I first, hello. Oh, I first was introduced to AP Three Percenters in New York City, um, or in Alster. It, it was really dark when we landed, and when they picked me up and they drove us around. So I'm not sure which town I was in in New York, <laughs> but that's where I met Scott and Anthony. And uh, I believe Scott is your national president. president. What a great guy. What a great group. And I am honored to have met um, uh, Alan tonight, too. What a great group of people. I'm amazed as I travel, and I've said this before, but I'm amazed as I travel across this country, um, all the good people that I meet, all the good patriots um, that are working so hard to restore the lost liberties. It can be done. And this is right here in this room. Because in this room, like Alan said, there is a wide variety of culture, of mm. talent, of capability. But that's what we need. Yes. That's what we need. We need all of us. We need each of us. Um, I want to, I'm kind of short for this podium, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> There's a stool. I'll have to be like Lucy and sit up on the, or stand on the stool, huh? <laughs> She's so cute. I have so enjoyed my time with um, Nathan and his family and that little darling daughter of theirs. <laughs> Let's set this down. Do you know where to find him? Okay, it says mom's PowerPoint angle, somewhere along the line. I am technically challenged, but um, I am a mom Steve. of 12, and a grandma of 25. When Lavoie and I met, uh, we, we had been married before, so this is a yours, mine, and ours, and theirs. Um, I met him, uh, just to give you a little background, to fill in the time, before I really read a long speech, because I have it words on every page. <laughs> I met him at a church dance when I was early 30s, and um, here's this gorgeous cowboy sitting on the stage with his and, um, I thought, oh, he's kind of cute. Cowboys. I wonder if he'll, you know, get off that stage. <laughs> <laughs> and they had the thing like a barn dance where they pull everybody together and put you in a circle and meet you up. And then as the song plays, they, they ring the bell and you get a new partner. And when the song ends, the boy is standing in front of me and we didn't get to dance. And so I was a little bit disappointed. I can't get any more for this story. But he was standing in front of me. And then he asked me if I wanted to dance the next dance. And we did. <laughs> and uh, then the fast music came on. And he said, <laughs> I, uh, I said to him, I said, well, you want to dance again? I got brave. And he said, oh, no. He says, I can't dance. And I said, oh, come on, you're just being chicken. <laughs> and he said, no, really, I can't dance. And he says, but if you can tell me how many kids I have, I'll dance this dance with you. Well, I didn't even know his name. <laughs> how was I going to guess how many kids he had? And I just said, okay, six. And he was dumbfounded because I guessed the right number. <laughs> he had six kids, ah! And they say us women are the package deal. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my goodness. And so he did dance the dance, and he was like Urkel, you know? He really had no rhythm. <laughs> um, but that kind of started us off. And I remember later on, you know, other guys were asking me to dance, and, and later on he came up to me and he says, um, can you give me a ride to my truck? I got a flat. And I went, right, probably the new line out there or something. 
It was the truth, because LaVoy never said anything but the truth. I soon found out. Um, we were married 14 days later. <laughs> yeah. Isn't he good looking? Aww. Yeah. yeah. Aww. Um, from that time, you know, we had nine, nine little children under the age of 10. And um, so we were busy blending. And we um, got into therapeutic foster care for teenage boys. And we did that for 18 years. And we had a daughter together. And so we adopted two of those boys. And um, that brings us to 12. <laughs> All of them are grown. My youngest daughter is 19. And she is still at home taking care of me. Uh, she, she's, uh, the term in, in the foster world is parentified <laughs> um, because she's worried about me. So she's um, watching out for me, especially when it comes to ranching because she's the one that learned. And um, I'm really grateful that she is staying to help me out with all of that. But the rest of my children are married and, um, well, Danielle and Mitch, three aren't married, but. That's where the 25 grandkids come in. <laughs> we don't do anything small. <laughs> they come in batches. Um, I've had the few at the beginning that came, and then all of a sudden, I had six daughters pregnant in one year. <laughs> <laughs> no. And it was the, cu it's the cutest little picture I have at my son, one of, let's see, is he my, no, second to youngest son's wedding. Um, there they are, all of my siblings, all the kids in front of me, and all of them are hugging the married couple in the center, and you see six of my daughters with their tummies at different stages. It's so cute, I just love that picture. <laughs> and a year and a half later, six more were pregnant again. And just last year, um, after LaVoy died, we had five new babies. So I really got, what is that, 17 in the last four years, it came really quick. But that's what happens when you have big families, right? <laughs> well, that kind of um, introduces you into uh, my world. I was a stay-at-home mom. That's what I did. And um, I loved it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my life. Um, I've kind of talked to you a little bit about the boy. He was a man of God first. He was a loving husband, he was an excellent father, an excellent role model for the boys that came into our home. Uh, they couldn't have, they were, I look at it as pretty lucky to have had him to emulate um, good values, integrity, morals, strength of character. He was able to teach them um, how to be a kind man, a loving man, and a, and a good father. And I've had the, lots of phone calls since he's been gone from all the boys throughout the years. Um, I just got a call the, uh, call the other day from Mother's Day from uh, one I hadn't heard from in probably 17 years because he was one, our first placement. And uh, he's doing really well. But he had waited a year and a half to give me a call because he was so saddened by what happened to Lavoya. But it's good to hear the little things that they got from him and from being in our home. So it was really a, a bittersweet call. Um, my husband was, like I said, a family man. Um, I was really grateful that he was home every day, every night, to help me with all 12 of those kids. <laughs> uh, but. He wasn't really political. He just knew how he felt about his country. Um, he didn't serve in the military, um, but he loved this country more than anything. And I think it showed when he was up in Oregon. Um, in Ephesians 6.12 it says, 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And Samuel Adams said, if ever a time should come when vain and aspiring men shall possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. Amen. Isn't that true? Yes. I'm in a room full of you. I'm in a room full of you. I've traveled across this country and met hundreds of you. And one of the, um, another bittersweet thing that I hear often from people is, I didn't know your husband at all until I saw him shot and murdered in that video. And then I looked him up on YouTube and I heard his videos and I watched him and I listened to him and his spirit, his countenance spoke to me. He was a good man. I know what they did was wrong. And, what, and they, he's inspired me. He's inspired me to get up and do, to get involved. That has been a blessing to our family, to hear that. To hear the fact that he is moving people through his message. And that you're all moving to do good and to, and to make changes. Lavoy traveled to Oregon January 1st um, to join a bunch of men and women who had gathered there to peacefully assemble and demonstrate and give their best wishes to the Hammond family. And I don't know how much of you know or understand this story, um, but that's what he went there for. He was. Uh, got received a call real quick and he said sure I'll come and he drove a few others up with him and he took an overnight bag that was it one set of clothes he had no idea that it would turn into what it did but he was willing to stay and stand because he believed in what he was standing for. Um, I wanted to allow LaVoy to kind of just talk for himself, so that's why I have the projector, and I have some of his words, because he describes what he was doing and how he was feeling and why he was there much more eloquently than I can. But I don't know how to work the technology. <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> I had to have my daughters load my flash drive because I didn't even know how to do that. And I was going to make a comment. I don't know if I did already. That's because I'm over 55 now. I don't remember anything. And I blame it on aspartame in my diet Mountain Dew, too. But um, there it is. This is the one. Um, in the Russians. In the Russians. Thank you. Um, Not today, Isis. Yeah. This is an actual video. 
So if you click on that. Yeah, yeah I said that. <laughs> I was going to say there's so much talent in this room, and we all are individuals, and we need each other because we can't do it all by ourselves, right? right. So with 12, That's I have right. 12 children, and each of them are individually talented. And I can get things done with all of them because <laughs> I can't do this stuff. Okay, I don't want you to edit, no. <laughs> Hey guys, make sure you're sharing this. Somebody tag John and Kelly and everybody so they can see Jeanette and the Bundy Ranch page. Somebody tag them for me. Pretty, pretty, please. Or throw it on that page or something. Like you can share this and then tag them on your own wall. <laughs> Hey, Larry. Justice for Lavoy. Amen. That's right. We have yet to obtain that, but the family's working on that, guys. Thank you guys for your beautiful comments, by the way. Washington AP3 and Jeanette Finnegan will love to review your comments later, I'm sure. This is at Burns, Oregon. Maybe I can bring it down to a little more. With a boy finicum. Each one of you, each one of you here today, are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important people. Each one of you here today are important and so that's why we're here today. And if our federal government would have abided by the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, we would have never gotten here. And so let us just kind of come to a, a simple level of why this is so bad at the federal level. Our founding fathers had escaped from tyranny. They believed in freedom. And so when they set up our government, they separated the powers, didn't they? And we all know what they are executive, legislative, and judicial branches. We know those three branches of power. Well, what has happened to one-third of our land mass? Do you know the federal government owns and controls one-third of this nation? Let me put that in perspective. You need to put in the, the country of Germany, and put in France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and better throw in Great Britain too. Then you're getting about the same land mass as what the federal government says that they own and control. And they say they have complete legislative power whatsoever. They have taken it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has upheld it. Yes, they have complete power whatsoever over one third of this nation. Now, let me explain it simply as I can, as I try to stumble over my notes here, is that for myself as a rancher, yes, my ranch is in Northern Arizona, a bureaucrat behind the desk can write a statute regarding me, my ranch. That has a force and effect of law. This bureaucrat is not accountable to me. We have not elected him there. Now, if I get contrary to that statute, there's a federal ranger with a gun that can enforce that. And if it goes from there, I am brought into a federal court. Neither the law enforcement, the federal ranger, has been elected by us, the people here. They are not under the power of the recall. Neither the Isn't bureaucrat he? that wrote the statute, yes, neither the law enforcement that enforces it, and now I am hauled into a federal court. All three branches of power under one head with no representation. Did we not, as Americans, face this issue some 200 years ago? Don't we remember that phrase? Taxation without representation? So now here we are, control without representation. One third of our landmass. It's an empire within our own country, unaccountable, unelected. The real power is in the bureaucracies. And so and that's kind of the simple part of it. You know, it's about family. It's, you know, it's about my, my family. It's about the Hammond family. I've spoken to many ranchers in Utah, in Nevada, in Arizona. They are all feeling the same thing. They're all feeling this oppression that is coming down upon them. Their livelihood is threatened, being taken away. Their, their 
ranchers are being regulated out of business. And so this is real. These families are real. They're not trying to cause problems. They're food producers. They help make our country self-reliant, free, independent. Do you realize that you have to go back to about 1955 to get as low as a motherhead count as we have right now in the United States? Have any of you ate a steak lately? Do you know the price of that? Mm. That goes way up. You know, if we had more demand, if we had more production, we would ship out more, we would feed more, we would be self-reliant as a country. These are we'll good people. Check your steak they prices produce, right now. They add to our country. They do not take it away. I want to say one more thing about here, what we're doing. Every one of you that, that says, this is an occupation until their demands are met, you, mm. you misunderstand. We're not making demands. We're not making demands. We're here to work. These buildings here belong to Harney County. These are Harney County public lands, the state of Oregon. This is theirs. This is their land. This is their state. It's theirs. And so we've come here to work. We've not come here to sit as children and, and stamp our feet and demand that certain things are met. Mm. We're going to go to work. We're going to try to help restore these ranchers that have lost their ranches back to them. We're going to legally go to the records. We're going to search out these ranchers. Over a hundred ranchers have lost their ranches here in this very area, in this very county, have been pushed off. See guys we would like to see them everything. return to their ranches, ranch again, log again, live again as free people. And so we're here to, to try to help that happen. We're going to go to work. We're not going to just sit down here and, and twiddle our thumbs. We've got a lot to do. And uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm just a I'm just a simple vet, um, and doing the best I can. I love this country. I, I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my family. And if we lose freedom, what shall they do? I want my children to get premature freedom, breathe free air. And uh, thank you. There's our friends. exercising their First Amendment right, unlike other demonstrations that we are continuing to watch throughout this we'll country, here soon, especially guys. as of late, you know, our college campuses are, it's horrifying what our children are doing. In the Declaration of Independence, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe in that. I know all of you do. Mm -hmm. And so farmers, businessmen, merchants, shippers, scientists, doctors, lawyers, military generals, university presidents, entrepreneurs. These are just a few, a list of, of the founders' choice of profession. We have the right in this country to choose what it is that we want to do with our time, you know, how we want to earn our money and spend our days. And um, I believe that as I am a citizen of this country, that I have the right to do the same. I believe that we all have the right to choose what it is we would like to do. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a few of the things that I've been going through, my family's been going through since the murder of my husband. 
Um, and part of this I'm going to read because it's kind of Lori, you know, has to do with lawyers. So. <laughs> My attorneys have been communicating with the BLM for almost a full year, trying to secure my right under my husband's permit as a transferee of my husband's right under testamentary disposition. Instead of following this clear federal regulation, the BLM instead obfuscated, refused to acknowledge that I was my husband's wife and widow, and they have denied any right to that permit and pretended that it simply was terminated upon his death. We show them the federal regulations that authorize the transfer of the rights of the permit to me and instead they continue to obfuscate and ignore it. And to this point they have refused to even acknowledge my rights under a clear federal regulation 4110.2-3E. Look it up, and instead, guys. ignore me and continue their obfuscation, thus forcing my cattle off my land and forcing me to go through litigation process again for this entire year. Let me go over this again. First, trying to get an agency to work reasonably with a rancher is apparently too much to ask for these days, and when and if they deny me my right to operate under my husband's permit, which so far they will not do officially, I am then second required to appeal to that very same agency for a review of their own decision before I'm allowed to then litigate in court. Wow. Then third, because they won't even give us, my attorney and I, the courtesy of an expeditious denial, we have been forced then to go through what could be seen as a separate but equally slow channel to find remedy, which is through the uh, congressperson's office. In summary, the effort required for a simple American to exercise their right is so monumental as to make it nearly impossible to earn my right. To top it off, She's it's also important to note that if we don't go hands, through this process, so I can be denied all rights see. to litigate in the future for not having exhausted my administrative remedy, which ironically, administrative remedy is also sought from the very same administrators who have been ignoring and disruptive to me in the first place. Very same. So they tell me to get off because I have no permit, so I take my cows off, and I have no summer range, so my father-in-law gives me five acres to put 150 head, Oh my God! and I have to feed them every day until my winter permit begins again, which is October 15th. I have friends that help me put the fence up, I have friends that come and help me put the water lines in, and bring me troughs and feeding feeders and then I had growers throughout the state of Utah, Idaho and Arizona bring me hay because I didn't have any money to feed that many cows every single day up here where you are blessed with grass which I covet <laughs> send her home with grass yeah. <laughs> it's legal here <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> That was just a stuff. <laughs> right, for the cows, for the cows. Sorry, sorry. So here I am I had to make feeding these cows every day. And my new motto is I can do hard things, right? right. That's been my motto for a few months now. I'm learning to drive a backhoe. I'm learning to use a forklift. I'm learning to get it out of the mud when it's stuck. And I'm getting to know my cows really well. You need to understand, truly, LaVoy married Miss Kitty and he was Matt Dillon. I was the city girl, he was the cowboy. Um, I'm an army brat, traveled the world with my dad when he was on assignment. So ranching was not what I knew. And so um, feeding them every day, I got to know them a little bit. And um, when it came time to go put them back on, I figured I, I was doing what they were asking. I filled out a new application. I turned in the application. 
they said that my husband had accrued $12,000 worth of fines. And so against my better judgment, and I knew I was probably going to have to get a finger wagged at me when I saw him again, but I wrote the check out and was going to pay the fines that they said he had accrued for going on two weeks early. And we like to move our cows the old-fashioned way. So mm. I had talked to all the ranchers in the area and got permission to travel across their land because my ranch is 50 miles from my house. And um, we had scheduled it all out, had water holes in each place, and my daughter and I and another daughter who came up uh, started pushing these 150 cows. And we had done the first 14 miles on horse and got to our campsite, and the next morning my mother-in-law came out and informed me that the BLM would not accept my check, and that if I continued forward, that I would be facing uh, impoundment of my cows, trespass fees, fines, and imprisonment. And so I'm out in the middle of the desert, and I'm wondering what the heck I'm gonna do, you know? and. I remember that night staring, looking up at the stars and thinking, what is it that I'm going to do? And I know this is sappy, but, you know, he was a quiet man, but every once in a while, <laughs> he was romantic, and he'd given me a star, okay? That's the sappy part. But I'm laying in the, on the dirt, and I'm looking up, and I can see my star, and all through the night, I kept poking my head out, and seeing that star, and, and thinking he's, he's protecting me, he's hovering over me, he knows I have a hard decision to make, and what is it that I'm going to do? I was so stinking mad. I wanted to say to hell with all of you guys, I'm going, and you're going to have to come get me, and you're going to have to take me off. But it wasn't what I was supposed to do. I'm not a boy. I can't fight it the way he fought it. And so I knew that I needed to find another solution. I had, um, <laughs> they come all the time, sorry guys. I knew, um, I had to do something different. And so some friends came and because they heard about my predicament out in the middle of the desert. We're in Arizona, there's no grass, no water. <laughs> and so all 150 cows are at this water hole that we had camped overnight and I have no food for them unless I move them to graze them. What am I gonna do? I can't just sit here. And so um, a friend comes up with an idea of loading them on a semi, He'll get him to come out. They came out. They didn't charge me anything. They came to my rescue. We loaded up all the cows and finished hauling the last three loads by truck and trailer, my horse trailer, and and uh, finished by midnight that night, hauling them all into a feedlot in town. And then I'm going, well, where am I going to go from this feedlot? You know? And it was interesting. My sister-in-law had come. And she says to me, Jeanette, I have just had you on my mind. And a couple days ago, I was talking to my BLM range con, and I was talking to him about what would it look like if maybe my cows could be on her range, and how hard would it be to, to get that approved. Okay, keep in mind, I had been working with the BLM for, at this point, 10 months or nine months. Mm -hmm and gotten nowhere for myself. And within 24 hours, she had permission for me to put my cows on her range. Within 24 hours, they were able to move that pencil or that pen, that ink, on that application. Wow. So that's where my cows are presently. They are on my sister-in-law's range, 90 miles from my house, and um, I'm still, I still continue to battle with the BLM. They're refusing to even respond to emails, phone calls from my attorneys. They will not formally deny me anything because once they do that, they know I can move forward. So it's called wait it out. Wait till she's broke. Wait till she has to sell off everything. 
America. Wait till the sister in law is tired of sharing her ranch, which I, she's amazing, the help I've received from my family. Again, I repeat, Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We can come through for her, America. Come on. Another thing that I've been dealing with this past year and a half is the media. Mm. <laughs> Maybe some of you have some experience with the media. Um, I know that um, they are in cahoots with the powers that be. We do not have a free press in this America any longer. No. It's people like Maureen or Gavin or, you know, uh, John, maybe Mark Levin, a few others um, in conservative talk radio. They're trying to keep us informed, educated. Pete! Pete, he's behind bars, but Pete, yes. Yes, he does a great job carrying that torch. So it's. I know that when they were first at Malheur, they had, I have been informed, that they had a meeting, all the press, and um, got together on what their narrative was going to be and how they were going to handle it. And that it, within the first 24 hours, the headlines read, racist, terrorist, anti-government, mm -hmm. anarchist, armed militia, armed standoff, and the list went on. The press and the environmental groups and their partners were very successful in redefining words while smearing all the conservative groups and the men and women there at Malheur. Um, patriot, constitutionalist, sovereign citizen, Tea Party, rancher, farmer, Christian, things, words, people are being demonized. Their definitions are being changed, manipulated. I read this book um, by Tom DeWeese. It's called Erase. I recommend it. It's a nice novel. It's, you know, get your mind off. Well, I don't know, because the content will put your mind on a lot. But it is a novel. It's fiction. So, um, but in his book, he had a quote by Milan Kundra. And the quote says this, and I found it very interesting. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, and its history. Then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invite a new history, invent a new history, excuse me. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around it will forget even faster. Are we not witnessing that now? Are we not witnessing the destruction of our country's history so in multiple forms? Statues coming down, and granted, it, it reminds us of a time that we're not so proud of, but they need to remain there to remind us of how bad it was and not to ever return there. Amen. How about the schools? How about how they are manipulating the textbooks and not teaching our children the correct history, the real history, or manipulating their minds to their garbage that they want to fill them with. And the media is hand in hand with all of these different ways. We do not hear about what's happening from one state to the next, from one side of the state to the next. We do not know what's going on up and down the West Coast. We do not hear it. I know I didn't. I was a stay-at-home mom. I didn't pay attention. But I had no idea when my husband started getting active politically. I had no idea that any of you were out there. I had no idea that Joe Robertson of 78, just because he had a pond, was in jail, sentenced to jail for 18 months for water. 
I had no idea about the Hage family, 25 years plus, fighting the BLM. I had no idea about the Dan sisters. None about the Hammonds. I didn't know the Hammonds until this happened. My husband and I had never met the Hammonds until I met them after he was killed. And as I continue to go across this country, I continue to hear more and more stories about the people who are silently being persecuted. Everything that they have imprisoned because it's a piece of land the government wants because the environmentalists want to shut it down. We've got, I, I pray that President Trump does half of what he said he would do. A fourth, right? These regulations are killing America. Just as my husband said, we aren't even voting on half of the laws that are being passed. They're in-house, and then they get to indiscriminately decide which rules they are going to follow. But we have to follow all of them. I have to abide by all of the BLM regulations, yet the 40 whatever, 41.10.2.3 on transferring of grazing rights, they will not even institute that in my behalf when it clearly states that I have a two-year period after the death of my husband to settle any problems that may continue then to graze. I own that grass. I own that water. I have a loan on it. I'm making payments yearly for it. Mm. It is mine, not theirs. Another issue that I've been dealing with is FBI intimidation. Um, who would have thunk? <laughs> who would have thought? I, I, I still, when I start to think about where I am and our family and what has happened to us, it is mind-boggling and surreal. You know, my daughters and I have been invited to speak all over the country, and um, there was one particular event in Colorado that the FBI, the BLM, and some Oregon state officials traveled down hey, before my scheduled event because it was out on Facebook, so I'm being monitored. They knew I was headed there, and they wanted to visit with the sheriff and the chief of police to have permission to raid my event because of a possible suspicious character, okay? We had no idea. My children and grandchildren were there. Other people's children were there. I had no idea. It was about 10 days later. I think the events are coming because event. I'm kind of suspicious. Um, you will never guess what I just found out. I just got through the Freedom of Information Act a copy of the memo that was sent out by the chief of police referring to us as sovereign citizens. And I went to go talk to him to find out what the heck was going on and why this memo went out to the whole town. And he informed me that the FBI and BLM and other officials had been down trying to convince them to stop us from speaking and to um, raid our event. Mm -hmm. And as she <clears throat> continued on, um, then the memo was produced. And it was just unbelievable. I was not happy. And that, um, that part of me that says, to heck with this, I'm going back there. To heck with this, they're not going to tell me that I can't go and speak my mind. This is America. I have the right to free speech. I am doing nothing wrong. I am doing nothing wrong. I'm not inciting violence. I'm not with a gun and go ablazing. I don't carry a gun myself. I have to be sorry, it's freezing up. But I am not doing those things. They're not going to tell me I can't. Hang in there. I didn't even know.
know what a sovereign citizen was. Okay? Um, and a batch of chili, and I can can. I have many other talents. I don't know what I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I better look at it. Because it is anyway, so I looked it up on the FBI website, and it's four pages long. long the difference to make sure uh, what's called. And so I want to read paragraph, not four pages. It says the FBI considers sovereign citizens extremists involved in the domestic terrorist movement, an anti-government group is closely related to the lands movement. Sovereign citizens do not represent an anarchist group, nor are they a militia, although they sometimes use or buy illegal weapons, refer to themselves as constitutionalists. Oh, yeah. Many believe, yeah, I just, isn't that just infuriating? Many believe that only white men have rights. They believe that the ratification of the 13th and 19th Amendment are unconstitutional, meaning Women never gain suffrage, and any election in which women vote is null and void. <laughs> Sovereign citizens don't pay their taxes, use bank currency, passports, license plates, and driver's licenses. Don't recognize government authority, courts, or law enforcement. Sovereign citizens commit murder and physical assault. They threaten judges and law enforcement, and they engineer various white-collar scams. This type of behavior is associated with rural and small town whites in the American West. Listen up, folks. That's According what you're to a being survey labeled. of law enforcement personnel, in 2014, sovereign citizens are now regarded as the number one terrorist threat in America. Whoa. That disgusts me. Not today, That ISIS. disgusts me. That they would put all of this defining a sovereign citizen, and then labeling me as none of these things, except maybe I am a woman who exercises, exercises her right to vote, and... Amen! Woo! Fantastic constitution. This is not okay. This is how they take a word and destroy it. Sovereign citizen used to mean something positive, right? Mm -hmm. Did it not? Correct. Like a tea partier? How bad has that been demonized? But now the word constitutionalist is being demonized because you follow the supreme law of the land, because you believe in that document. We're now being demonized. On May 3rd, as I, I, I drive to different places a lot for these um, events, and um, I was listening to the FBI Director Comey's testimony. Um, and it was interesting, at one point I had to pull over because I wanted to hurry and put notes in my phone of what he was saying in the moment. And I put it down here, he said he testified that approximately 2,000 open investigation cases, of which 300 might be contributed to foreign and non-citizens, the rest of the open cases for terrorist actions or behaviors or suspicions are open cases with Americans. That is 1,700 open cases. My question to Mr. Comey is, what definition of terrorist are you using when you apply that to an American citizen? Mm. Okay, think about it. The Hammonds are in jail under a terrorist charge under the Patriot Act. That's why they had a mandatory five years for a back burn. A back burn, common for rancher. My second question would be, why is a rancher who starts a fire on his property to stop that fire that is fast approaching his home and private property is considered labeled and prosecuted as a terrorist. My third question to him would be, why would hard American citizens, ranchers, farmers, miners from across this country be considered terrorists if they stand up to the overreaching BLM and environmentalist groups stealing their property and livelihood and chosen way of life? 
I would ask, I think us in this room and those of you who belong to these 3% groups, you better be asking yourself whether or not you're on this list. You better be asking yourself if you're one of the 1,700 individuals being investigated because you stand up for this Constitution, because you believe in the freedoms that we were entitled to have, our right to have, excuse me, I misspoke, our right as American citizens to have in this country. Amen. Amen. Right. So if we're constitutionalists or involved in Western lands issues here in the West, then we're sovereign citizen terrorists. Amen. And I'm going to fight back on that label. I'm going to push back. And how I'm going to push back is by doing what I've been doing. It's by going around and speaking, explaining who my husband was. Because I am not okay with the label that they put on him. I am not okay with him defaming who my husband was. They don't know him. My voice, my 12 children's voices, my grandchildren someday, we will not stop. He deserved better. He was a hard working man. He was an honest man. He had integrity. He, had, he loved his family, his country. And when he said he never had even so much as a speeding ticket, that was true. Or they would have found it and they would have tried to smear him with whatever they thought they could have found. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They killed the wrong man because they couldn't really find anything on him because there wasn't anything to find. He wasn't anti-government. My husband was for limited government. He was for pro-responsible government. He believed in his First and Second Amendment rights. He believed the Constitution to be the law of the land and to protect it. He believed that in that scripture of love thy neighbor as thyself. Truly he did. It was on his vision board. Because that's what he did. He served in the community. He served our family. He served me. He served those kids that came into our lives. He was loving the Hammonds. When he got out of that truck, he was loving Shauna and Victoria and Ryan. We will remain steadfast in the account of my husband's message because I refuse to have his voice buried along with his body. We claim our right to freedom of speech, free from intimidation by those entrusted with the reins of our government. I will not be intimidated and I will not be silenced. I have nothing to fear, for I have done nothing wrong. And when you can say that, there's power in that. I will continue to stand.
Samuel Adams said, it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen to set brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. And I would like to think that Lavoie, the patriot that he was, set a few brush fires of freedom yes. and liberty in, in the hearts and minds of many across the United States. That is sacrifice in his stand for freedom, for liberty, for agency, was not a thing. And again, I would like to thank you for inviting me here Amen. and for hearing my story. But there's so many more that are still suffering. And I am so encouraged by the mission statement that I read on, on the group here and listening to Nathan and Scott tell me about the AP 3 percenters. What you're doing is good. Be involved, actively involved in all the ways that you guys are doing, because we can make a difference. There is hope. Freaking I have crying. hope. Love you, Johnny. I know that I'm going to see the boy again. I believe that because I believe in God and I believe in our Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for that knowledge because it brings peace. It lifts me up. It buoys me up. It helps me. I know I'll see him again, and I hope that um, after I get done punching him, <laughs> I'm going to kiss him, and I'm not going to let him go, and I hope, I hope, I hope he sees what we're doing here, and I hope he's proud of us. I know he is. I, ha I brought one little video, because we see all of these videos on YouTube. You can find it before he died. Um, but I brought another little video. It's just a real short clip from my phone um, one day. And it's just the grandpa. Guys, this is Dasher and Mom. I'm gonna let you guys go for right now. <laughs> My battery's low, and I've got Jason Patrick to still talk to. Any calls I missed a video call with him, but um, I'm sure he'll forgive me for this time, this one time. So um, I love you guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say goodnight for right now, and I'll get back with you guys later. Okay. You guys take care. Thank you for sticking out with me. Uh, also, Please share, TV, spread, and make this viral. Share, spread, and make this viral. Okay.